All set for your power disc game today, guys. Yeah, all set to kick Way's butt. I'm gonna power disc your face. Do these guys have school at all? Work? We know that schools exist in this world, but these guys just play power disc all day, every day? All right then. Core is obviously the main focus of this shot, but Wing and Asami are both completely still. I guess Asami blinks a couple times, but it still looks weird if you focus too hard on it, so don't do that. Lin never offered to train you? Nope. And I guess I never thought to bring it up because I was learning to airbend, then there was the pro bending, then I got tied up fighting the equalists. It was a busy few months. And all of book two, you were pretty busy with that as well. I guess Cora wants to purge that from her mind too. <laughs> the amount of things that Varric has magnetized to him seems to double in between shots here. It worked! Julie, mark it down! On to phase two! Julie cleans up this mess! Poor Julie. Also, it's cool to see Varric's development in technology. This is the first time we've seen magnets in the show because it's a brand new discovery to him, but in book four, three years after book three, there's trains that are helped run by magnetism. It's a little fast for development, sure, but we at least get to see a bit of progress. Also, also, Varric is a fucking menace. What kind of madman finishes a cool invention, needs to test it, and thinks, I'm gonna put magnets all over a suit, walk into the dining hall where a bunch of plays and cutlery is made out of metal, and just absolutely trash everyone's meal, launching all of that metal at a high rate of speed towards my head. I want to know what goes on within his brain. How many push-ups did you do last night? Because I did like 50. The cars in Avatar are always just in their own little world, and honestly, I'm here for it. This might be the first time we've ever seen below Iway's belt, but he's barefoot. Obviously, he has to be to sense change in vitals, but I don't think there's a single time where the animators forget about it. This is the first time I've ever done this, but I remembered that Google Translate lets you take photos of languages you don't know and translates it for you. So I did that here, and this card says Dr. Guio Acupuncturist, number 23, Zalfu City Street. Which is pretty cool that it was relatively accurate, but a little disappointing to be honest. I'm now waiting to do one of these translations and it just says something fucking ridiculous. Then again, Google Translate might not be the best option to use. It's decent at what it does, but just for fun, I translated the Aang wanted sign from Atla, and it says, Apprehend! Remove magical powers! That's supposed to say the Avatar, by the way. Catch! The identity of the fugitive? Away magical power! Control the whirlwind? Flying like the wind! Be careful! Be careful! The order of the Lord of Fire! I'll be the fire-loving king! Huh. And now that I'm launched into this Google Translate tirade, after translating that wanted poster for fun, I realized that the Chinese characters in Atla tend to be written up and down, like ancient Chinese was, but the Chinese characters in Korra takes the left to right format that modern Chinese and a vast majority of language use today, so that's really cool. We're three seasons into this shit and I've never noticed that. I guess I can't read Chinese, so it's probably not that bad I haven't noticed. These vines grew out of the lake and into Republic City pretty much instantly, right? How many people died a horrible death as a vine rapidly grew through their bodies or pushed them out windows or shit like that? Like, this isn't some small vine you can just jump out of the way for. This massive log right here is taking up the entirety of the stairwell, or whatever this corner is. That had to kill at least a few people. Ugh. Ming Hua is just chilling up in a tree here. I literally have not noticed her a single time until just now. I always thought she was just not in this one frame. You still want to try to take out the president? No, he'll have to wait. Now we know that the Red Lotus has multiple and probably every single world leader on their hit list with Kazan's line, and to hear saying, he'll have to wait, tells us that they have an agenda and a plan, which solidifies their threat even further within the viewer's mind. I can't get over how clever lines like these are. They tell so much of the story and world without wasting any time whatsoever and somehow not making it feel rushed. It's insane. I will never stop being impressed by the quick and clever storytelling of book three. Zaheer, why do you look like that? What happened to your head? <sighs> There's no money. I just made my last delivery. We don't want money. I, for the life of me, cannot place who the voice actress from Minghua is, but she sounds like some other creepy character in the franchise. Maybe one from Avatar? No, I must be imagining things. How many of those things are you going to stick in me? I'll be placing several needles on each of your acu points. There's nothing to be scared about. I'm not afraid of needles. Please, close your eyes and take a deep breath. This process will correct the imbalances in your chi. 
Please tell me if you feel any pain or pressure. I really like the feeling of the needles going into Lin's body. The way they stop suddenly with no noise or reaction from Lin really helps them feel light and gentle. You can tell that Lin can't feel them before she says it. Your chi must be powerfully blocked. We're going to need more needles. This guy's voice inflections make him sound a lot like Iroh. Sue, what are you doing home? <laughs> wow, you almost look like a real cop. Fun fact, young Sue is voiced by Jesse Flower, who, as many of you know, voiced Toph and Atla. Wonderful choice in my opinion. Of course they would bring back a Beifong to voice a daughter Beifong. Let's see what they stole. A pocket watch, some jewelry, that looks like a wallet, pearl necklace, a fucking cowbell I guess, some shiny metal object, Bluetooth headphones, and I have absolutely no idea what these blue round things are. Good haul, I say. What are you doing hanging out with these losers? They're my friends, and you have no right to call them that. While I do think that Sue is obviously in the wrong in this scene, this specific line is valid to an extent. Professionally speaking, if Beifong is on duty at the moment, calling the person you're trying to detain a loser is probably not the best thing to do. Personally speaking, calling your younger sister's friends losers while trying to discipline her is just going to make your relationship worse. Basically, yes, Lin is in the right, but she's kind of being a bit of an asshole about it. The way these stones and pedestals are placed hurts me. N none of them are symmetrical. These meteorites are perfect for beginning metal benders. The metals have a unique property, making them easier to bend. I assume this unique property is that there's a bigger earth to metal ratio inside, which makes total sense. We also see multiple times in the show that pure metal, like Hiroshi's mecha tanks or the cuffs that are put onto core at the end of the season, are unbendable. This means that there is a minimum earth to metal ratio that makes it unbendable, which I'm now curious how small it can get. Could Toph be able to bend the few molecules of earth left in the platinum? Does it even matter if we get down to molecular size since the earth can't go anywhere because of the surrounding metal? I could go off all day on this and god damn it that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So first let's set this spreadsheet up that can calculate the earth to metal ratio of this specific material. Volin? Is that you? No! Brilliant move. Checkmate, Cora. Oh, hey ladies. I was just, uh, I was just looking for Pabu. Pabu! He's on your shoulder. Oh, look, there you are. You know, I thought something was chewing on my ear. I'm probably gonna need to get a shot. Pabu has a sort of a, a venom, a venom. Anyway, so what are you guys doing? You're metal bending over here or something? I got nothing to say here. I love Bolin. I'll just stay and watch. Hey, man, that earth was really well landscaped. You better repair that. I like how you can feel Korra focusing on the pieces and then really lock into them and start to bend them through the animation. I just like how they did that. Alright, I'm gonna say it. The super early T model cars drifting and screeching their brakes like it's an action movie is fucking goofy. These cars aren't doing that shit. They'd roll the second you take more than a 45 degree turn. It's an early model car that will say fuck you and break down whenever it wants, not high tech cruisers meant for chasing other cars. Chill the fuck out, Lynn. You're lucky the car didn't crash and kill multiple people. Sue? <gasps> What did she do? Did she sneeze? Did she bend every single needle out at the same time? What happened there? Also, this guy having multiple needles in his head now is really funny. Don't even think about taking one more step! So that's how she got her scar on her face. It must have been an insanely deep wound if it's all still showing 30 years later. The last time we saw a scar like that, it was on Zuko, and we all know what happened to him. This can also add some sympathy to Lin's side of the story. Even if I do still think she's being unreasonable about this drama 30 years after the fact, permanently disfiguring someone would create a grunge in anyone. Good afternoon. Where are you off to today? I, uh, got a delivery to make in Baoyu. I should be back later today. He just has this paper? Is this a forged document of his supposed delivery? How'd they get this? He hands it to them for identification. What? ming -Hua knows how to drive? She was born without arms. She didn't lose them in the middle of her life or anything. Who the fuck taught her how to drive? I guess if she did this water arm thing since she was young, then I guess she's able to, but driving is something that tends to require having arms. Hmm. <laughs> 
I'm gonna make a compilation of Bolin making weird noises someday. Just you wait. I'm, I'm just, I'm just frustrated. I've been trying to metal bend and I can't figure it out. <sighs> Don't tell anyone, okay? Why not? Because it's, it's embarrassing. This isn't the first time I've tried. I mean, I've been wanting to metal bend ever since I heard about Toph. This is some nice dialogue that eventually sets up Bullen's actual real talent. I've said it before, but I'm super happy that he's not able to do this cool subtype of bending, but instead able to do an even rarer type. This also helps show some insecurities and vulnerabilities he has within a character. Look at us, talking about our feelings, supporting each other. It's nice. I got nothing to say here. I love Bolin. This rock right here was not on that side of the pedestal when it originally fell, and you know what? I'm fucking pissed off about it! I've compared this exact same shot in this episode multiple times to see if any needles move, and I can say that the first two times this shot is shown, the needles' positions match, and the second time, they don't. There's eight on her chest where there should be five, on her right shoulder there's two when there should be three, and on her left there's two where there should be only one. It, am I too far deep into this? What were you thinking? And what were you thinking? You two have put me in an impossible position. Sue, you need to leave the city as soon as possible. Lynn, give me the arrest report. Mom, what are you doing? You can't cover this up. There were witnesses. I'm the chief of police. I can't have a daughter in jail. Okay, so here's about where I stand in this situation. I do want to say first, this drama is actually pretty well written. There's not much of an obvious fix, and again, the many different outcomes of what could have happened all have their own pros and cons, their own black and white. But, here's my general opinion on the situation, and it seems to be pretty unpopular one going off of what I've seen in various places of the fan base. During the flashbacks, the events that took place over 30 years ago, Sue is absolutely full stop 100% in the wrong. She's hanging out with the wrong crowd, she's doing shady shit for them, she's committing actual crimes with them, and when Lynn catches her, she gives her a massive, permanent scar across her face. Not cool whatsoever. Lynn, while she probably could have been more gentle and talked to Sue more respectfully, was in fact just doing her job. She had no idea that her sister was one of the robbery suspects. She was just an available responding unit and would have arrested anyone in the car, no matter who it was. If it was just a regular officer, he probably also would have arrested Sue as well, and I think Lynn's anger is very much justified in this situation, especially after the whole facial disfigurement incident. Toph, however, has always kind of given me some power abuse vibes in this scene. There's plenty of corrupt cops that won't arrest their child even if they were breaking the law, and we always look down upon them because it's an asshole move to not punish your child that has clearly violated the law. And that's exactly what Toph does here. To be fair, she does kind of unofficially exile Sue from the city and give Lynn chief of police as she resigns, but this move was kind of unnecessary. Toph says, as chief of police, I cannot have a daughter in jail, but she totally could. Sue is a young teenager that is doing stupid teenager stuff. Punishing your own daughter as the chief of police for committing a crime might actually do the opposite effect and would earn you some reputation. Since it's clear that you are serious and fair about your job and will give the rightful sentence to whoever, even if it's a family member. Hell, cops sometimes are even harsher to their kids than they would be to any other teenager because they're supposed to know way better than this. Stepping down from power and letting Sue get off scot-free was not the smartest way to go. So let's jump to the present. It has been 30 years since the first events took place, and Lynn is still salty about it. She won't talk to Sue, she won't open up to her, she doesn't even consider having a single conversation despite Sue having clearly changed. Like, she built all of this! She's a family, she's the leader of a city! Just saying that she hasn't changed at all is fucking ridiculous. And it is very clear how willing Sue is to reach back out to Lynn and make reparations. She and her mom have already done that with each other, and they both have tried to reach out to Lynn. It's literally just on her at this point. Mom and I already talked about this years ago and worked things out. If you had gotten together with us like we'd asked, you would know that I'm a different person now. I've been a different person for a long time. I said this last episode, but Sue's rebuttal of you've done a bang up job of keeping it that way is like all of my thoughts on this summed up in one sentence. It's Lynn's fault at this point. Not only is she insufferable to be around despite Sue's best efforts to give her housing and feed her, right after this, she literally just goes and fucking attacks her, like trying to kill her. So while I agree that Sue was in the wrong all those years ago and Lynn was just trying to do her job, now the blame needs to be placed on the only reason the Beifongs are still torn up apart, which is Lynn. 
You know what, Lynn? You're the one who hasn't changed. You're still a bitter loner who only cares about herself. No wonder Tenzin ended things with you years ago. Fucking got him. God damn. Cor and Bolin are in the back here just like, uh, should we go? Should I stop them? You don't have any siblings. Fighting is all part of the healing process. True. Very true. Go, Mom! The fact they don't all jump in and Wing says, Go, Mom! They probably don't realize the situation. What are you two doing? Your sisters! Why would you want to hurt each other? Good fucking question, Opal. Uh, who's gonna knock? No, oh, no, 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 not me. You're the avatar. Why can't you do it? Uh, I can. Why, why is this so relatable? Everyone has been in a similar position like this before, and yeah, no one wants to be the first one to go up. Good morning. Happy and cheerful Lin Beifong is my sleep paralysis demon. Your mother and I have a complicated relationship, and it's probably difficult for you to be here. You're a smart young woman, and an excellent airbender. That is true. Opal is very emotionally intelligent and knows who she is and what she wants to do. That's what I like a lot about her character. She's very nice and gentle, but she stands her ground when she needs to. Like when Boleyn was creeping her out, or when her mom and aunt tried to fucking murder each other. She's not afraid to do a lot of things most people are afraid to do. I really like Opal. She's very likable, very strong and smart, and she has a good purpose in the story, as well as being the girlfriend that Boleyn deserves. When I was younger, all I wanted to do was please my mother. I became a police chief because I thought it would make her happy, but it didn't. You need to make decisions based on what you want. Does Beifeng regret becoming a police officer? I mean, she stuck it out this long. After both Toph and Suyin packed up and left when they didn't like their lives, I would think Lin would do the same thing. We should have grabbed one of those cops. Maybe they know something about where the Avatar is hiding. She could be anywhere. We'll find her. It's just a matter of time. She's with the Metal Clan. That is a good stinger. What is he doing in the spirit world? How does Zaheer know she's with the Metal Clan? Who or what is he talking to? Can he spy on her somehow through some spirit magic? It's left purposefully ambiguous to get you on edge for the next few episodes. Great ending. This episode is another really good one. Most of it is focused on the Beifeng story with Lin finally making up with Su Yin after literally trying to kill her. We get some good insight into Bolin's insecurities and we have some good character beats for Opal as she puts an end to the fight and yells at her own mother and aunt for being unreasonable. I've said my piece about the Beifeng drama already, but I do want to reiterate that it is a good piece of writing. It's a complex situation that involves the lives and careers of three different people and the blame and responsibility shifts from person to person as time goes on. Su is originally to blame for doing the whole robbing thing, then I at least blame Toph a little bit for just letting Sue get off scot-free, then 30 years later Sue and Toph have moved on and become a family again, while Lin is the one that must change. It's a pretty complex situation, and it's nice that there's no obvious answer that the characters are conveniently overlooking. Good episode once again. I don't think season 3 has a single bad episode. Hey, if you like this episode, consider subscribing. I also have other social media accounts if you want to talk to me and my fans. Patron shoutouts! If you want to support me and my work and be two episodes ahead, you can support me on Patreon. Link is below, as usual. Shoutouts to my top patrons, TieFire02, who knows exactly when to stop shaking salt onto his meal. His sodium levels are immaculate. Dizzy Payne, who has the vocal range of the lowest of bassist and the highest of sopranos, but has absolutely nothing in between. And ScarfXB, who can crack open any aluminum cam with just his eyebrow. Big thanks to my other patrons, Nuck Tuck, Drunk on Hugs, Nicholas Schultz, Kyer Walsh, Ryan Jans, and Tipo. Thanks, guys. I will never stop being impressed by the quick and clever Stella... Stella touring? Am I having a stroke? This guy's voice inflections make him sound a whole lot like young... Young Ira? No, that's next line with young Sue. <clears throat> My reading is not reading very well today. Put that line down to just so I don't... Okay, there we go. I've compared this exact same shot in the episode multiple times to see if any meat... I've compared this exact same shot in this episode multiple times to see if any meat... Any... She won't talk to Sue, won't open up... Won't you open you up... Doesn't even consider having a single conversation despite Clue having clearly... What did I say? Coup? Did I just say Coup having clearly... Eh, whatever. 
then I at least blame Toph a little bit for just letting Sue get off Scott 3. Scott 3? Man, what the fuck? Then I at least blame Toph a little bit for just letting so so good Then I at least blame Toph a little bit for just letting Sue get off Scott 3. Scott 3. God damn it, I was so close. Then I at least blame Toph a little bit for just letting Sue get off Scott 3. Scott I'm gonna kill someone. This is irritating.